are live yes we are it's wednesday wednesday start sharing start sharing the news like daryl said he's coming up he's going to be sharing the news with everybody first i want to thank everyone for each and every week we're on the 66th week since we began when COVID started and we're going strong and building such a wonderful documentary series podcast true house stories it's, I, I just can't thank you all enough for tuning in each and every Wednesday religiously. And you also, if you can't, because some people do have jobs and we do happen to work too, you don't catch the show live. You can always catch it on YouTube on the True House Stories, Lenny Fontana and all that great stuff. But anyway, I like to start with welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. Disco ruled the world. There was a time when they said Rome ruled the earth. So did New York City. And you know I say this each and every week, and I really do have to say it passionately. When it came to breaking records, and a time when it was all new, New York City did rule the roost. Okay? Can't put it any other way. It was magical. Also a crazy place full of alcohol, drugs, prostitution, and all that goes with the nightlife of what makes a city tick. Plus you had Wall Street and all the wonderful things and people that banks and bankers that went out and wanted to be part of an industry that maybe they didn't understand, but they loved the glamour of it, but didn't realize all the dirtiness behind the scenes. But today... I'm going to get right into this. And this man's career starts around 75, 1976, and he's still going strong. He looks good. He's got his fighting gloves on. You know, he's, a, he's what I call a heavyweight contender to the game. Okay. And he, you know, his, like, he was telling me his children don't even realize this part of his life. But he's coming here today after I've asked him a few times and he agreed to do it. And I was so glad to get him. I like to welcome to True House Stories one of, one of the innovators of this game that starts out from R&B to disco and, and beyond. And he'll tell you what he's doing today as well with all the wonderful video work and everything he does. He's still very active in the game. I like to introduce to all of you, Mr. Daryl Payne. Yes. Yes. I appreciate that. Lenny, thanks for having me. You know, I appreciate it. And I think what you're doing is great. It's all about, you know, preserving the legacy of so many wonderful people in this business, you know, like like myself. And you've done, you know, hands down to you, man. And uh, much love and respect, man. So. Thank you, brother. We love you, man. We, first of all, we love you because you made some of the best records we know. You got to beat the street on the journey i mean the list goes on and on and on but i just don't even want to waste my time talking no more so here we go people lenny's gonna be quiet now we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get some good history knowledge and i say knowledge because he was in a lot of different pots this is what's crazy about he's going to explain how this whole thing developed and it was at a point where it was really the beginnings of this. So first question out of the blocks, and then that's the last question, and you take it away, brother. How does music start for you from you know the early age and take us all the way through? Yes, yes. I started in 1976 when I was 16 years old. And I was always passionate about music. And I actually started doing promotion. I put the entertainment in 21 clubs every week. And the uh, club owners would pay me $500 a week to bring artists that would perform. When the artists would perform, it would help increase sales because back then the clubs influenced sales. You got sales from selling your music and your records. We had 12 inch records back then based on what was playing in the clubs. So even without airplay, everything started in the clubs. That's what I loved about the business back then. The clubs were influential on what got played on the radio. You know, now it's, it's about how many Spotify users you have, how many Instagram followers, TikTok. That influences it. But back then, it was about the music. Okay, so because I was putting so many artists in the clubs, 
I knew the record label executives and I got friendly with a lot of them. And, uh, and I played the drums, I was a drummer. Born and raised in Queensbridge, New York, right underneath the 59th Street Bridge. That was where my humble beginning started. And uh, I would come in with a reel-to-reel -reel tape and I would meet the guy at Atlantic Records or meet uh, or Ray Caviano at RFC or, or all the guys at Warner Brothers. And they would let my music play for like 15 seconds and they would eject it. And they'd say, ah, no, it's no good, no good, no good. And I would say, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? And they would tell me what's wrong with it. I'd come back four months, five months later, and I and I and I tell the secretary, please, you gotta let them let them hear this new song I did. You know, if they don't like this song, I'll jump out the window. I make them laugh because I always had a way of getting in the doors. I was always a charming guy, you know, always charming. I would come a second time. This time they let the song play to the chorus. They ejected. A year later, uh, I would come back, and. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think what gave me the strength, Lenny, is a lot of people don't believe. A lot of people feel that you're never going to make it. You're a black kid trying to make it. They're running around. And, and it was tough because in my day when I came up, you had to have real strings, real horns, real arrangements. You know, I'm not acting like I'm all that. But you take a lot of the music that I've done, and I'll go back to what I'm saying. Songs like, you know, uh, uh, Beat the Street had real strings and real horns. Never gonna you know, never give you up by Sharon Red and Carol Williams and Carol Douglas same background on that. They were like assassins when it came to background vocals. Now, can I just say one quick little thing yes, to yes. us as house producers? We use those records like architectural engineered records yeah. to listen to as go to. So keep going. Yeah. So you understand yeah. what you were doing for us? We yes. were the benchmark was so tremendous. What mm -hmm. so but the question I have real quick is mm -hmm. you bring these real to real tapes. What style of music are you bringing to Caviano, Warner Brothers, Atlantic? Right, right. We're bringing dance music, you know, dance music. It was dance music. See, there was different styles. In L.A., they had one type of dance style, dance music style. In New York, it was different. You know, I, I've always respected my favorite dance music producers, and I, I'll give them their props to me, were guys like Dan Hartman. He was number one in my book, the most powerful dance music producer. Just kept taking you higher. I used him as a bar. He was the best. And 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 it's unfortunate he's not here, but he was the best for my money, pound for pound. And the other gentlemen that I looked up to, and I'll go back to what I was saying, well, guys like Patrick Adams, you know, Leroy Burgess, Hubert Eves, uh, Kashif. I thought Kashif was the most polished producer. He had a way of being very sophisticated. The backgrounds were precise. The, the bass sounds were just incredible. And he just had to say, but what I did differently than all those guys, with all due respect to them, mine was more raw. It was raw. I mean, it was dance music that was, you know, I'm a drummer. So I always believe that when you make this kind of music, give people angles. Never let something be repetitions. My shakers, we hear shake of my records. You hear syncopation all over the place. Bass drums, snare drums, uh, you know, side sticks. Everything's going to move in a rhythmic way that's different. Because she would never make a record like No News Is News. He was too polished. But I did a No News Is News by Crimsicle. You know, the wine, me, and dime. It's an anthem. Songs like I Need You Now, that's been sampled over 500 times. It's an absolute anthem. Probably the most sampled dance record in the history of dance music. And, and the guys that played on that record are guys that I grew up with in Queensbridge. You know, you had Michael Trax, you had Charlie Streak, you had Bernard Fowler singing lead, you had Stephen Cumberbatch on guitar. These were the guys that I, I grew up with as kids. You know, DJ Molly Marl, you know, used to look up to me, you know, and, and watch, you know, what I was doing, you know, back in those days. Uh, it was it was an incredible time. But getting back to getting in the door, I went went to see, you know, and I'm not this is no saying anything bad about him, but I went to see Eddie O'Loughlin. He had a label called um, uh, Midsong Records back then. And uh, and uh, Carol Douglas, who was doing a lot of backgrounds for me, along with Carol Williams, goes to Eddie O'Loughlin and says, Eddie, listen. There's this young hot producer. I want him to produce my next song. He's got it. This kid is so talented. So Eddie O'Loughlin says, okay. He called me up. Eddie says, hey, Daryl, listen, Carol Douglas thinks you're really talented. Come on in and let's see what you're doing. Let's see. Let's hear what you got. I played him a song called Feel All Right, by, which ended up being by Kamiko. It was on Sam Records called Feel All Right. Okay. And what happened was I got jilted. I produced the record. 
Never had a contract on the record at all. You see Gary Turner's name, but he did nothing. He sat there like a bump on a lot. Did nothing. I mean, that's just what it is. I went and got the singer. I named the group Kamiko. And I played a song for Eddie O'Loughlin. It's the same, a reel to reel. We used to put the music back then on reel to reel tapes. So it really sounded good for the record executive. They did it with a cassette. The cassette quality just wasn't good. So we would go and make a nice, good reel to reel copy. Eddie O'Loughlin says to me, he said, Daryl, I'll pay you $1,500 as an advance to you to produce Carol Douglas on this song. I'll give you three points. I said, Mr. Lachlan, I think my song is worth more than $1,500. He goes, nah, you'll never be worth more than $1,500 as an advance from anybody and not more than three points. You're not worth it. He told me that. I swear to you, I had 50 cents to get back home on the subway. He would have wrote the check for $1,500 right then on the spot. I humbly take my tape and I leave. I had some, some consecutive number one hit records within that year. To his credit, he calls me up. He says, is this Daryl Payne? I says, yes. He said, this is Mr. Eddie O'Loughlin. He said, I owe you an apology. He says, I said that you would not be worth more than $1,500 and worth more than three points to produce anything. I have to tell you, you're more than worth it any time. You know? I also want to share a story about Prelude. I mean, you know, Hubert Eves, Patrick Adams, who, who had uh, a prelude a little before I got there. Uh, you know, we had the pleasure of doing a, a song called On a Journey. You know, I sing the funk electric anthem. That's one of the first electro dance records at that temple ever made. It was ahead of its time. The song was so ahead of its time, but I sing the funk electric on a journey was fire. Okay. Eric Matthew is just so talented. I mean, that guy had talent. He had real talent. But uh, so that was the first deal that I made because I made all the deals. When Eric and I worked together, I made all the deals. So all those deals were done strictly 1,000% by Daryl Payne because he wasn't a sales guy. He wasn't the type of guy to go out and sell. So we could, wait, 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 wait. Incredible so far. Mm -hmm. Marvin Schlachter, did you have to deal with Stan Hoffman and, yeah. and, and the mafia? That's yeah, let, me one go there. let me go there. Let me go there. Can but go before there? you go there. Yes, sir. Go back to Kamiko. Yes. And yes. you said the studio. Because we need to know mm -hmm. did you work at a Bob Blank studio? Where were you working? Who at the garage? Who were you doing? Yes. We we did feel all right in the in at unique recording studios. That's where that was recorded at. And um, it was a great studio at the time. It was a place that was affordable. It was only fifty dollars an hour to go there. And and it worked. A lady named Joanne and her husband owned it. Uh, very nice people, and uh, they always gave me credit, so that always helped too. You know, they didn't charge me up front. But going back to the Kamiko, uh, the young lady there, her name was Kelly Curtis. I could have made this young lady a star. She sang lead on it. She was supposed to sign a contract. That's why I never put an artist in the studio unless I have a contract signed. But back then, I'm 21 years old, 22 years old. You want to trust everybody. You want to believe everybody. She says, Daryl, I'll sign the contract. I record the song, I bring in the studio. A guy named Lenny White was signed to Electro Asylum and promised her he was gonna make her a star. He told her, don't sign with Daryl Payne, I'm gonna make you a star, because he's on Electro Asylum. I told her she's making a tremendous mistake. So, so what does she do? She doesn't sign my contract, I do a buyout. I pay her a thousand dollars, buy her out, and then, I, and then Carol Williams and Carol Douglas, who sang background on Feel All Right, that's Carol Williams and Carol Douglas singing the chorus to Feel All Right. They went out and worked as Kamiko in between working as Carol Williams as a solo artist or Carol Douglas as a solo artist. And they went out and did the shows. The interesting part is when it came to, I'll tell you this story, uh, uh, Marvin Schlachter said to me, hey, Daryl, listen, we have an artist, we want, to be, we want you to work with Sharon Red. I said, great. So uh, I, I play him. Uh, uh, never give you up. He loves the record. He loves it. I play him the song Beat the Street. He doesn't like it. He said it's no good. He said it's a piece of, tr it's a piece of trash. I play him a song called Thanks to You. I had another young lady named Gila Jones singing the demo at the time. This, this is amazing. This is a mafia story. It's gonna, this, this goes there. Uh, Marvin hands me a check. To, to, to start working on the, the, uh, on the on the Sharon Red. He says, but bring me songs, bring me songs. And I come to him again, I says, Marvin, 
this song, Thanks to You, is a number one hit record. Sharon should do it. He goes, no, Daryl, I don't hear it. I don't like it. I don't hear it. I get home. The next day, I call him. I says, Marvin, I don't think this song is for Sharon Red. He throws up his hands. He says, well, if it's not for Sharon, it's not for Sharon. Like, what the hell do you want me to do about it? So what I do, I go walk around the corner to, come to Morris Levy's label. Morris Levy had a label called Beckett Records Buddha. And I sit down with Morris. And they, they love it. They're not letting me out of the office. They say, hey, kid, this is it. We're not going to let you. They say, here's the money. Here's the this. Here's the that. They'd have given me the next born for that song. You know, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that. So now I signed a deal with, with Beckett. They paid like $25,000 for one song, which was a lot of money. You know, I mean, and back in those days, I would do two or three songs a week. And I'd make 40 to 60 grand a week. So imagine a 20-year-old kid, 21, 22 years old sing that kind of money every single week, right? So Francois starts playing to rub it in uh, Stan Hoffman's and Marvin Schlachter's face. He's playing Thanks to You in the office. And I'm on the phone with one of the promotion guys. I swear to this is the God's honest truth. And I hear Marvin yell, take that goddamn record off. Don't play that record in this office no more. Don't you play that record. He's yelling and screaming at the top of his lungs, yelling and screaming. It gets better. That night, I go out and I'm partying at a club. I run into Chuck Leonard, who was a DJ at 98.7, 92, whatever the hell it was. Old, you know, Chuck Leonard. 98.7 Kiss, FM yeah. New York, right, everyone. Right, right. right. WKD, right. I say to Chuck Leonard, he was emceeing a show that one of my artists were performing at that night. I says, Chuck, these guys are prelude. They don't pay royalties. They just screw. They just screw us out all our money. Chuck Lennon went and told Marvin Schlachter that Daryl Payne said they don't pay royalties. Marvin Schlachter called Stan Hoffman, who's connected, and they tricked me into the office. They said, Daryl, listen, we want you to see us. We want you to produce other artists. I had four tiny guys hit me against the wall. You better not say nothing about us. We pay royalties. I'm like this, right? I'm like a little kid, you know. Oh my God, oh my God, the mafia, they're gonna freaking kill me for great sake, right? And I literally run out of there. They said, You better get that record back. I said, What record? That thanks to you record. We want it for Sean Red. I said, You I'm scared to death. I'm twenty. I'm scared. I said, I said, Marvin, I said, you know, you didn't like it. I played it for you twice. I came in, you said, if it, I said I'm I said, Marvin, I don't think this record's for Sharon. You said, Well, if it's not for Sharon. It's not for Sharon. Like, do what you want to do with it. He says, get it back. I said, I sold it to Marvin Levy. He says, get it back from him. So he told me, literally he told me out of the office. Really, I'm, I'm not kidding. I am not exaggerating. I walked four or five blocks Mar to Morris Levy. I said, Morris, I got a problem. He said, what's that kid? I said, I went and took your money for thanks to you. You know, he gave me like fifteen to $20,000 for the one song. I said, but Marvin Schlachter, is saying that the, rock, the song belongs to him. He said, did you sign a contract for that song? I says, no, but he threatened to kill me that if I don't bring him that song today, they're gonna kill me. Morris Levy, I said right there, Morris Levy called him. He says, Marvin, you're getting a visit. He says, you're gonna leave that kid alone. You, it's not your record, leave that effing kid alone. That's it. And Marvin Levy, Levy called the guys on Prelude. But when that happened, what Marvin did was he always tried to screw around with me on the credits. So if you look at a lot of the credits, it's all wishy-washy. They don't want to give me the credit, but Daryl Payne made that album. Bottom line, I was there and then guess what? The second album, the Love How You Feel album, Daryl Payne wasn't there, it flopped. With all due respect, it didn't chart, nobody played it, nobody talked about it, it was no hits. The reviewers in Billboard says, Oh my God, I love Sharon Red, but where's Daryl Payne? Where is he? The magic was gone. There was no magic. I wasn't there. You know, look at, let's take a kiss. A... Hang on, brother. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Explain this. This is the part yes. I'm hearing. I, I get that. I know. Wait. Yes. How does Sharon Red become a superstar? What did you do to make her? To be, because she, they had her, right? They had her at the label. So where do you, you come in as this kid? You're selling your records. But how do you make this magic happen? What what happened was, you know, my sound, and once again, I'm not acting like I'm all that. 
It always has a pop feel to it. I'm giving you the raw elements of dance music, but I have pop melody lines, catchy choruses. I always believe in throwing a lot of choruses at you at once. So it always starts going. Always take it higher and higher. Give people more. Give them the breakdowns. Give them the excitement. So songs like Never Give You Up, it went top five all around the world because it was pop. That was the biggest song she ever had in her life, was Never Gonna Give, Never Give You Up. The biggest one. The second biggest one was Beat the Street. You know, and let me tell you how that came about. I was at the Studio 54 party and I heard a song called, uh, uh, Don't You Want Me, Don't You Want Me, Baby, right? I heard that. And I heard the bass drum. And I watched all these people going, but I said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. If I can take the, the elements of how they did that and put a more syncopation to it, so it was more soulful, it was more black, right? And I took the, how that bass drum was moving like this, and I gave it that syncopation. That's how I came up with the beat to beat the street. And that's, and then I gave it the elements of Isaac Hayes of that old shaft with the strings and the horns and the bridge. So it's like, it's like soul, black exploitation movies, the way you heard music back then. So I was giving you productions. Here's the reality, whether people want to admit it or not. When you take away the string arrangements of my songs, you take away the horns, you got house music. Byron Stingley, the lead, the lead singer of 10 City called me, he said, Daryl, he said, listen, when we were doing all that 10 City stuff, we were trying to be like you. He says, we can't, we got it from you. See, I Mike keep the, saying it over listen, and over. Mike, listen, Mike, it. watch this, Lenny. Mike the Hitman Wilson, respectful producer out of Chicago, house producer. He came to my office, he said, bro. I, he said, let me, he says, he bowed down. He said, yo, bro, he was like this. He was like this. We, when we were making house records, we had a crate of Daryl Payne records in the studio. And this is what we were trying to be you, but we have no money for horns. We don't know how to write string arrangements. We don't do none of that. All we had to do was do the basics. So, house, so that's that's the element of, of, of house music. That's what it is. You think of songs like No News Is News. What do you think that is? It's a house record before they called it house music. On a journey, it's house music. I need you now. It's all right. Let me do you. Those songs were on Warner Brothers, Sire Warner Brothers. Those were house records without the title. 1000%. That's what they were. You know, and but we didn't and, call it that. We just called it dance music. Called it dance music, right. That's right. Period. Dance, right. period. And, and here's the other thing I'm the gentleman, believe it or not, that started Jive in black music. I bought Keith Diamond, who owed me money, and it, may he rest in peace. But I had invested money. We were supposed to go half and half. We were recording a couple of projects at Unique. He couldn't pay us half the money. He was a struggling artist at the time. Beautiful brother. I loved him. Made, made his soul rest in peace. But I took him with me to Jive because I was a hot producer at the time. And Clive Davis wanted me to produce artists that were famous in England for a label that they were getting behind called Jive. So I did an artist named Richard John Smith for them. I did Katie Kassoon. So Katie Kassoon record should have been a big hit. I felt that it was one of my most polished productions I've ever done in my life. And the guy who wrote that song was Barry Eastman. I gave him his first start in the record business. Barry Eastman was my keyboard player. The guy would stand over my shoulders in awe and say, Daryl, how can you show me how to make records? How did you do this? I mean, how do you do this? And I would sit there and show him how I would do it. And he was my keyboard player. Another guy, Skip Anderson, who went and produced all the Luther Vandross stuff. He was there with me also. He played the, the keyboards on Can't Get Away From Your Love by Carol Williams that came on Vanguard. Wayne Brathwaite, may his soul rest in everlasting peace. His first record he ever had on in his life before he did Freddie Jackson. He wrote Can't Get Away From Your Love by Carol Williams. That was his first record that ever charted. So I gave so many people, you know, Chef Pettibone, who was one of the greatest remixers of all time, I bow to this brother's talent. I gave him his first break in 1980. I, I took him with me. I said, listen, you're gonna remix uh, No One Can Do It by Carol Williams. It came out in 1980, 1981, whatever that was. He never seen a studio before. And he mixed it and he did his own thing. And that was his start. And I gave him his first hit record. He mixed, you know, Thanks to You by Cinnamon. And, and I was the first person to have the syncopated hand claps. 
<laughs> That's right, because at the garage, man. Ta -ka -ta -ka -ta. Right, right. Listen, uh, listen, not take not you know, not bragging. I created that sound. Bottom line. Whenever you hear that, <laughs> Gerald Payne created it. That's a fact. Because the first record to ever have that with that rhythm is thanks to you. You never heard that on no record ever, ever okay but never clarify where the sound actually comes from because we know it now they used to do with uh now rogers they would use that two by fours and go ka ka and they would record that of course with the claps of everybody doing it how did you get that sound at that yes. time we used the lynn drum machine to get those claps and we would sequence it uh that's what we would do we would use it and i just i'm a drummer so i have these rhythms so i so that rhythm that's my trademark. When you hear that, people knew it was a Daryl Payne record. You know, then another thing I would do, I had these Chinese rhythms. You would hear it in Feel All Right. You hear the ticky 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 ticky. You hear that in Thanks to You. You hear that in uh, Kamiko, Feel All Right. You hear these rhythms, these Chinese Oriental type rhythms. I'd love to put that into the songs. And when it comes to the drums, the bass drum, the bass is going to be killing. It's going to be fierce. You know, and, and, and my thing is this. You know, I remember going to the Paradise Garage and people would scream. When a Daryl Payne record played, people would literally try to climb the walls. I mean, they would scream. It just wouldn't just play. They would go absolutely bonkers, just absolutely insane. And, and I knew that I had something special and, and I was so appreciative of the dance music community. Let me tell you another story you didn't know and nobody knows this story. And I don't even tell this story. In 1983, I'm 23 years old now, I'm getting older now. Uh, I went on a date with a female singer named Michael Brown. And I was producing uh, uh, stuff for Jive Records at the time. And I went on a date with, I took out Amy Stewart, made that song Knock On Wood, remember the dance record Knock On Wood, and uh, Michael Brown, who's a female. Who was, was that the, the Symphony of Love? Did she do yes, it? Yes, that was her. Polly Dorn, right? Polly yes. right? Yeah, yes. I remember. Which in America was E3 and my capital, whatever. But watch this. So we're in the limo, we're going to this club. She said, Daryl, let's go to this club called the Hippodrome. So it's a gay club, but it doesn't matter. I'm with two girls and we're all having fun. It's all nothing but a party, right? We're partying. And a guy heard, somebody from the security told the DJ in the mezzanine who was spinning records that Daryl Payne was there. He calls me, he's playing In the Name of Love. That was the number one gay anthem. I produced that. My, but Marvin Schlack, the screwed up with the credits, but I produced it, I was there. My, I did it. In the Name of Love by Sean Red, a gay anthem, absolute gay anthem. He's playing it. People are going crazy. He calls me up to the DJ booth and says, I want to say Daryl Payne is here, a legend from New York. Oh my God, I love him. The DJ's name was Ian Levine. When I introduced so Ian, who had never had a hit record at that time in his life, Michael Brown was my date. He says, Daryl, I want you to hear this four track demo. And I'm listening to it. In my in his in the headphones he's got while people are screaming at the hippodrome screaming downstairs they party blah, blah, blah. the song is called so so many men so little time i asked michael brown i says he says could you think you can get michael brown to sing it i says i'll try her career was kind of faltering it was basically over i said listen i says michael you got to do the song you got you know and we wasn't serious man we dated a couple of times i said you got to do this song i begged this woman for two weeks, we got to do this. Song. I said, do it for me. Do this song. Do this song. She didn't even like it. I negotiated the contract for, I think the label was called Record Shack. I, just, I did all the paperwork. The song comes out. It was a number one hit record. Once again, had it not been for me, because she was with me, Michael Brown would have never sang on that. I used to sit at the table with her daughter named Sunita. She was a kid. Sunita, you know who Sunita, Sunita is? She ended up going with Simon Cowell, that whole thing with, you know, those big reality shows, a lot of that stuff was her idea. But I remember sitting there with Sunita when she was a kid, having dinner at the table with her mom and Sunita. And she became a big superstar all over Europe. You know, so the stories are just absolutely amazing. I mean, they're just amazing. And, 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 and you know, I, I've always looked up to, you know, like I said, guys that came before me, like I said, give them their props. You know, Hubert Eves, Kashif, you know, Leroy, you know, Patrick Adam, Leroy Burgess. Those guys were just so talented. You know, 
uh, another guy who passed away. His name was uh, Gregory Carmichael. A lot of people don't know him. He's an albino brother. He's been he's left us many years ago. You know, he was like a strange kind of guy. He was kind of like just strange. But the guy had a, a way of getting things done. Hang on. This is what I'm going to ask you now, the Greg Carmichael thing, because everybody was in that same building in Manhattan. Everybody, Sunshine Sound, Greg Carmichael, because even John Morales brings this up too about. It. So go ahead, tell us about the albino yeah. brother. Yes, yes, yes. He was a, 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 a very, I could never figure him out. I would see him at record labels, and he was albino. So when you looked at him, you never thought he was looking at you. You know what I mean? He was just strange. He was a strange, to me, I was a kid. He was he was very strange to me. Let me tell you this story also. I, I went to uh, when Thanks You was out, and and this song was selling when it first came out. It was selling fifty two thousand copies a day for three weeks straight. If the record was fire, I mean fifty two thousand records, not shipped, was selling every single day. And this is with no music video. People have to understand when we make dance music back then, no one no one did music videos because MTV. VH1 wouldn't play black artists unless she was Prince of Michael Jackson. So a lot of these records that might have sold 400,000, 300,000, 500,000 copies, had we had music videos to this stuff, it would have been 10 times, 20 times bigger, but we didn't have that opportunity. Had I had the opportunity to produce a Janet Jackson, could you imagine if Janet Jackson sang Beat the Street and Thanks to You and all that? Forget it. And they, and they would have put the promotion dollars behind it. Our music played because it was good. It was exceptional. The people wanted it. Not because there was some rich label pushing it down your throat, spending all this amount of money to promote and break these artists. You know, that's, 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 you know, but I tell you what, you know, pound for pound, I'll take my top 10 records that I've made in my career during that time. I'll put them against anybody pound for pound. Now the other guys might've had bigger records and yeah, because they had music videos and it was Janet, but on the strength of just being dance music that people dance to, I put mine against anybody. I don't care who they are. During that period, I don't care who you are. I think I'll get you. Without a doubt. Now, here's the thing I need to ask. Mm -hmm. You're a drummer, so you're doing all drum programming and stuff. Mm -hmm. You got Earl Young, who creates the 4-4. That, he doesn't create it, but he embellishes it, and Gamble and Huff and all the Philly sound make that thing happen. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. You're coming up 76, 77. The 4-4 four four is becoming the standard, the four-kick sound. Mm -hmm. Where's you, you talk about doing that Chinese type of rhythms mm -hmm. and stuff. Are you now at the beginning, like, listening to what was going on in Philly to, mm -hmm. to help you create what you were getting? Yes. Like, what's part yes. of these yes. pieces? Great, great Here, here's the thing. I felt that the music that we were making in New York could never compete with the Philly International. It was, that was on another level. They were up here, we were down here. I, I, listen, I, I'm never gonna get that twisted. They had the best musicians that money can buy. And they were a unit. You knew Vince Montana was on the, on the vibes. You knew that Baker, Harrison Young, you know, those guys were there. You know, they had the best musicians. They had the best recording studio. They were at Sigma Sound, the Cream de la Cream recording studios. You know, we were, we were different. We had to make those records quickly because we needed to get that check. We needed to have to go pay that rent. We had to go buy that car. You know, we didn't have the luxury of like a Quincy Jones. You could take five years to make an album. Guess, guess what? If I had the money and somebody was paying me a million dollars to make an album, guess what? It'd be just as good as a Michael Jackson album because you got five years to make it. We didn't have that luxury. When you lived in New York City, it was hustle, 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 bustle. You know, make that dance record, get paid, go to the next one, make that record, get paid, go to the next one. Cause we're trying to survive. And if we want to live, here's some real talk. We want to live like the rich white producers. We couldn't, they can make records at a slower pace, but they were getting five times more than we were getting for doing the same music. You have to understand, people have to understand that. You know, when you, when we were out here, the labels weren't there for us. I'm here to tell you, none of those labels, None of those labels, they did never said, hey, Daryl, let's teach you the business. You know, let me have a good conversation with you. You're a smart guy. Let us teach you the record business. They teach you nothing. They want to get your music in those dance days, use you. Once you realize what time it is and you realize you're being used, they'll get some more people they can do this with. 
So there's as layers and layers of people that they can use. What made me different at the end, Lenny, is I outsmarted them. Because I said, you know what? I might not own the rights to a lot of music I made back in the day, but I own the rights to 100,000 masters that I bought and I own. I bought you know, you know, nine music labels where I own all the rights to the music. And I did that almost in retaliation for how they treated me. So I would buy TV show rights. You know, I started a company in 2004 called The Legends of Classic Soul. You know, we did 50 artists, you know, uh, Dennis Edwards' Temptations, The Whispers, The Shylights, The Dramatics, The Dells, Ray Goodman and Brown. We did them all, you know, and, you know, to preserve, you know, soul music or R&B music so we can, you know, preserve this so we can have this for generations and generations to come. Now, I'm right in the middle of an IPO with a company I have called StreamNet TV. You know, we have technology. So many of my peers, Lenny, and it hurts me to my heart. They don't change with the time. But look at all my dance producers. Who, who do you see? Tell me, name one dance music producer. This is no knock on none of them that can compete today. That can go out here, look young, look fresh, still have talent, have something to show for it. All these guys, they're living up in no, you know, one studio apartments, no money, not knowing where the next dollar's coming from with nothing. And you give your soul to this business and you wind up with nothing. There's no pension for us. There's no pension. So unless you reinvent yourself. That's right. Lenny, unless you figure out other ways to make it, you know, you're walking dead, you're alive, but you're dead. You're not gonna make it. So you have to get technology. You can't do business how business was done in 1980, 1978. You can't. You can't do business done in 1999. You remember right, about right. 1978, forget Watch that. This, I don't mean to go off the subject, Lenny, and I love you. Watch this. Guys call me, hey, Daryl, old time. Yeah, I'm dropping a new single tomorrow. I start laughing at him. You're dropping it away. Okay, everybody's got technology. Throw something out there. Where are you going with it? Where are you going? What are you doing? You have no money to promote it. Can't go to radio. You have no social media. You have no marketing dollars. You got nothing. You just, you just, just, just throwing stuff out there. Be throwing stuff out there. Well, you're going to have to explain that a little bit to how the difference was that you did very little back then and got a few DJs to play things opposed to what the, the system yes, is yes, today, an yes, algorithm-based yes. operation. Yes, yes. So yes. can you explain yes. that to these yes, people yes, that are watching? Yes. Back then in our time, we had what they called, as you know, we had record pools. There might have been 20 to 30 top record pools, IDRC, you know, with Eddie Rivera. May he rest in everlasting peace. Judy Weinstein, SOS, real record pool. These guys, if they got behind your record, they liked it. You you did you sold records. You said you sold units. We would go to record stores. We'd go to Vinyl Mania. We'd make the rounds. We had a new twelve inch record. I would go to Rock and Soul store. I would go to Downstairs Records, Downtown Records, this store, that store, and get it played. Let people know that this is the new artist we're putting out. We would go to the clubs, see the DJs. It was more personal. It was more personal. You would see people. Now nobody sees anybody. Back, in, you know what? Back in my time, when you seen a record producer, Lenny, you could look at him. He's a record producer. Now, you look at these guys out here today. You don't know who's a record producer anymore because nobody has the look. Doesn't even look like. Nobody looks like a record producer anymore. That whatever happened to that? None of these guys from my generation never changed their image. They look like a bunch of old men. They, they, they're tired. Change, I say, change your image, change your look, try a new hairstyle, put on some fresh clothes, fix yourself up, look like you, you can do something today. But if you're looking old and tired, who's going to do business with you? It's a young people's business. And I'm old, but I'm not going to work with a bunch of people with all due respect. I'm going to work with the young people. Work with the young people. You can do it. You can do it. Just change with the times. The New York Yankees, you're not going to put guys on the team that's, you know, 60 years old. You got to go, you can make a commitment to the youth. And that's what it's all about. But Lenny, and the people Lenny, don't get that. They don't understand that. So you got to be really careful. And I've talked to the, some of our elders. They're yeah. even a little older than us, oh. a lot older than us. And they, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I also, you know, I, I'm not as, I'm not as forefront as you are. I'm going to be a little bit more like, well, you kind of have to do a few things, but if you don't understand today's business, that it's all algorithm based, right. meaning exactly. that you don't even have to have any talent. But if you have millions of people following you, you can have a hit record just from that streaming. It's crazy. Yeah. Watch this, Lenny. What I loved about my time, you had at the record labels, you had, we call them record people or music people. They loved the music. 
they nurtured your career. They had departments called artist development. That doesn't, I said to them, nobody knows what that is today. Artist development, what the hell is that? Nobody knows. They, they gave you touring support. There was sections in the mu music labels where they gave you touring support. They pay for your equipment, your PA system, your this. They would help you tour. They would help you do TV shows. Now, nobody does nothing for you. There's no such departments anymore. There's no, there's no love of the music. Now, at least back in my time, the music industry was run by music and record people. Now the business is run by accountants and lawyers. They have law degrees and account degrees. All they know is numbers. Now you're just, you're just a number. How many Spotify copies? How many, I mean, how many Spotify followers you have? How many TikTok followers you have? How many people are engaging? That's all it is. And, if, and you got the numbers, you get the deal. You don't have the numbers, you don't get the deal. It's real simple. It's real simple. You know, so we have, and by the way, I started a new music label called Stream World Entertainment. We have, you know, three or four artists we've signed. We've made music videos. I pulled back from promoting it until like beginning of January. We're going to put substantial money behind it. You know, timing is everything and we want to do it right. I'm too old not to do it right. I want to do it the right way. And we're going to give these artists the support, you know, that, that they, they did deserve. And also, I want to give a shout out. You know, we lost two of our artists, Lenny. You know, two people we worked with over the last two months. I mean, big shout out to, uh, to Raheem uh, Howard, who, who's one of the dancers with us. He's part of the Vern Williams family. You know, he's in our music videos. Big shout out to Jay Wills. He films all of our music videos. He passed away suddenly about a week ago. Peace and, you know, and, and, and made their spirits, you know, living, you know, forever. And those gentlemen will be missed. Look, so I have a crew. I look at me, it's like, I'm the older guy laying out of the bunch, but they're my guys, they're my guys. You know, I just hope that, you know, that people can, you know, can have problems, you have things in your mind, talk it over with people. You know, you're not sure about things, you know, talk it over with your loved ones. You know, let's not make rash decisions because we just lose people that you spend time with every single day. It hurts. You know, you almost feel like you failed them for Christ's sake. So, you know, just everybody, you know, let your loved ones know that you love them. Right. If you have problems, please discuss it. A big shout out to Raheem Howard. And uh, and, uh, and and Jay Wolf, you guys are loved, man. I mean, it's, and these, these guys are young, twenty-seven years old, thirty-two years old. The whole lives ahead of them, and just much, much love, man. I just feel like I don't even sleep right at night because of this, because it just it bothers me, you know. But I love these guys, you know. But we're gonna keep pushing forward, Lenny, you know. And and I'm and I'm hoping and believing that we can create new magic, you know. What we've done in back in the day, that's great. But you know, we want to push forward. We want to create new artists. New legacy. You have to. What else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to stop? You're going to stop now? Why? Why? That's right. And and you know what? I, and, and I feel like also there's a lot of unfinished business from my standpoint. A lot of things musically I wanted to do that I didn't do. So this is one time we're going to try to do it. And, and we have the capital and the infrastructure to do it. The marketing and, capital right, is so right. key. And the technology, you know, because I have tech, I own technology and you can go to streamnettv.com and see it. We have streaming channels. We have our own, we have six people working full time around the clock developing technology. You have to be able to compete. You, you, you can't go nowhere if you can't compete. You have to have the resources to compete. You're going to get very frustrated. You're going to be so frustrated. You know, you need the tools. It's like we said to me, hey, Daryl, you need a tune up for your car. I said, okay, Lenny. And you give me a toothpick for the tools, I can't do it. But if you give me the equipment, give me the right bloody tools, I can give you a tune up for your car and you'll be on your way. Same thing with the business today. Let's change. I say to my old school, my OGs, change with the times. Them days are gone. We can remember them. We have great conversations like today. But adjust, a change, change your looks, change your attitude, change, you know, learn about computers. Listen, let me tell you some money. I try to send artists royalties, right? I can't even send them money. They, they, they don't have PayPal. They don't have Venmo. They don't have, they don't have nothing. <laughs> oh, it is, I get a headache. I said, why do they, why they even do this? It's, it's like, it's, it's brain brain damage. Yo, can you come bring me the cash? Oh. Please. You're like, oh. but wait. Okay, so I got some serious questions. Yes, I don't even know where to begin. Frankie Crocker, the chief rocker. Hollywood. Hollywood, baby. Hollywood. He made and break a lot of people's careers, man. 
Yes, he did. And I know you. <laughs> I know you part of that game too. Listen, that 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 gentleman. A, a lot of you artists hear me out from back in those days. Frankie Crocker not only helped make my career, but a lot of you too that are listening. And he deserves some fresh flowers on his grave every month. I thank him all done. the time for all the yeah. things he did for all yeah. of us. He was a see, and that's just it, Lenny. New York City, Frankie Crocker, they were leaders. They broke records. When they got behind something, you had a hit. Everybody watched what New York City was doing. And Frankie Crocker led the pack. You know, and he, he was brilliant. New York now has become a follower. Everybody follows. No, New York is a follower. A hit is a hit everywhere else. New York is the last place to break something. It shouldn't be that way. Can I explain that to everybody why that is? Because I believe uh, the, the main problem is, you know, st uh, radio stations like uh, radio chains or conglomerates like Clear Channel programs all the music from a central location. Each program director in each city or radio station can only program three songs himself. So if you got 35 songs in a playlist, the guy at the station can only program three songs. So you got all these clowns trying to kiss the radio program directors behind to get their songs played. But you got to realize you're not Sony. You can't give away PlayStations as gifts as for, for the radio stations for, for promos. You can't give away big screen TVs. You know, you're not universal. Where you get trips away to Disney World. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you giving to, away? What are you doing? You got nothing to give away. You got nothing to give to nobody. So your music's not going to get played. So you got to go to Clear Channel and say, hey, listen, this is what the majors do. Hey, Clear Channel, we're universal. We're going to spend $10 million with you during this quarter. Here's what we want played. We want this, 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 and that order. And you don't stop playing until I tell you when. Because the stations make their money from advertisers. That's how the game is played. So all my comrades, you got no chance. You got. Did you hear that, everybody? What he just said. They dictate the show. They dictate. It's That's not right. the other way around. That's right. Now wait. Now let's go back in time. Let me let me put you back in the spaceship. Back. Yes. Yes. Roll the roll the tape back. Yeah. So there was a thing called payola. Yes. And he's got these record labels. So what happens there with guys like Morris Levy? They want to push yes. it. And they would here's, say, this, we're going to push the button on this record. Right. What does that here's, mean? here's how this worked. Morris Levy, to his credit, had you, no matter which way you went, he won. You know, everybody knows that he was involved with the General Vs and the Colombo family. It's, it's public record. So I'm not, don't stick me up. Don't shoot me. All right. He was sentenced for it. He was found, he was convicted of it. Racketeering. So that's public record. But what he did that was smart and what people did know, not only did he have the DJs in his back pocket, he owned the manufacturing plant. A lot of people didn't know that Morris Levy owned the manufacturing plant that was pressing up the records for the major labels. The major labels didn't know it. And what Morris Levy did, he owned a chain of record stores called Strawberries. There was a big record store chain, which ended up being coconuts and all that Sam Goody and all that stuff. But Morris Levy had that. So records were going out the back door. So all the records that he was printing for Universal and for Warner Brothers and all this other stuff, all those records were wind up in his record stores and he would sell the records and kept all the money. So not only did he control the radio because he had the radio program directors in his back pocket and what the radio stations would do, Frank said, okay, listen, I'm going to go on the Carol Williams record and we're, we're doing three shows for my station. You had to come perform for free. If you didn't come perform for free, your music was not going to play. You went there, did the show, you came and did the interview, you had a hit, you went to work. You, you did work. So we had to play that game too. When Frankie Crocker calls, uh, the 90.7 uh, 90 Kiss calls, uh, WKTU calls, you had to do their shows for free. And then the and then the, the the radio stations collected all the money at the door. So they'll get two thousand people there at ten bucks a piece. They made themselves twenty grand, ten, ten, twenty thousand. They kept all the money, the radio stations. Right? So think about it. So they made money by giving these parties. They had the door. They paid off the radio stations. Well, the radio stations were being, you know, then and then the, and, the, and Morris Levy had the manufacturing plant pressing up all the damn records. 
So it's a constant win-win for them and lose-lose for you. So you're going out, you're, you're, you're pimping, you're pimping the artist, taking it to the gigs, doing everything. That's right. Never get any money. That's called promo gigs, everybody. Promotional right. gigs. Right, right. Listen, Lenny, I've said this many times. People have heard me say it. You know, and I don't mean to be a repeater. I break the music down this way, Lenny. Here's real talk. The music labels are the pimps. The artists, the music producers, the singers, songwriters, we're the prostitutes. The people that go to the clubs and stream the music and download the music and go to the concerts, you're the trick. That's what this is. That's how I sum up this whole business. It is, is, it is never going to change. So simple, 42nd Street, the pimp is right behind you. You're working the car, that's and right. you're just doing the you're doing the that's job. It. And that's 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 what it is. So you, how much money you give them? Well, they take all your money. They take all your money, right? Guess what? And give guess you a couple right. of cents back just for you to maybe go get a sandwich. Let me mention this, Lenny. Listen, Lenny. I've sold millions of records in my career. How come I made more money not making music than I did making? I made more money not having hits than when I had hits. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next thing. You said this now like this. You went, I'll take my 10 records right. and put it up against anyone <laughs> pound for pound. Anybody. And we're going to tell you this. This okay. is from me now to you as an endearing producer to produce a DJ. They are some of the fucking greatest records of all time. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And, and we all say, and, and, and I see a lot of people, Kevin Hedge from BLS, they're all here. Molly Maul said the same. They were all shouting out to you. Brother, they love okay. you. They're all there. They're all there in the chat. But here's great, the question. Molly, Molly, I love you, brother. Oh, yeah. Molly, everybody, they're all saying, what's up? They love you. Mm -hmm. from Queensbridge Appreciate and all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Daryl, you're all over the city, bro. We know your name like synonymous. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. What that. happens all of a sudden? It's like, poof. You disappear. Yes. See? That's what you hear what I said. Oof. Yes. What happens? What happens to what? Why do you all of a sudden decide to either stop or change gears? There's a deciding factor that happens. Here's, here's what happens. Please share it. I've produced over 6,000 records that have come out that have been released. I've done that. And, you know, feel free to go to DarylPayne.com. There's a discography tab in the right-hand corner. Hit that. Just hit it. You'll see over 100 pages worth of credits, and you'll see around 6,000 produced releases, right? I've had, I've owned labels called Classic World Productions. I never went away. I've had over 500 albums on a, a, a back, catalog, back catalog label I own called Classic World Productions. We produced over 500 albums. We were selling hundreds of thousands of CDs a week to Walgreens, to CVS, to Best Buy, well, that, that was my business. We had an office warehouse in uh, Aurora, Illinois. I owned a building. And we, trucks would come in and we're moving goods, moving goods all over the world. We know, I, you know, I was in partnership with BMG for years. I bought the rights to the Judy Garland show. Pine Entertainment was my partner from 1998, 1999, 2008. You know, I've done, done deals with Sony Television. You know, uh, they were my partner selling uh, 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 the Judy Garland show on television. So I've never stopped making deals. I just, right in the middle now of closing a deal with P. Diddy, right now with Revolt. You know, we're doing big business with Revolt TV. Big shout out to P. Diddy. You know, uh, all my people there, James Brown, Mr. You know, Dave Duff. I love you, man. I did a deal this year with Mark Cuban, right? So I'm still dealing and people, they deal with me. You know, I mean, I take care of business. You know, and, you know it's great to take bows from back in the day, but I'm here for what's happening you know, today. You know, we want this new money out here. No, today. we know that. No, no, we know that. But you got to understand something. You being as a forefront hot, hot producer in the dance genre, all of a sudden, you don't see any more of that. You know what I'm saying? What makes you? What makes you say, "Ah, f this! I ain't doing this." Or what makes you make the gear change? Because I, I, I wised up. You know, when when you're doing something so long, right? It, it you, you know, you, you get tired of it after a while. You know, you want to do other things. You want to do bigger things. You know, I want to be able to collect the money myself. When I'm producing for other labels, they're collecting the money for me. I have to go and chase them for the money. Listen, I believe in the Don King theory of business. The money comes here, then it goes down there. Once the money goes down there first, it's never going to make its way back up to you. So my thing is, is to, 
to own rights, own television show rights, own concert rights. You know, because of John Diaz, we know we own concerts by Sting, Meatloaf, Metallica, Lenny Kravitz, the Fugees, Busta Rhymes, Tribe Called Quest, Tears for Fears. We have the only concert by the Cranberries ever made. You know, it's all here. We have all this stuff right here. You know, so we're coming out with music channels, concert channels, streaming channels. You know, it's, it's about, I did that. I did that. That was during for that period. And it was great. But it's, it's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be more to it than that. You know, you know, I, I'm 61 years old now. There's so much more I want to do with my life. By God's grace, hopefully in four or five years, I can finally retire and, and you know, just, you know, just take it easy. And, and, and you know, but I just, I'm still passionate. And I'm doing music again. I'm here, my, I have a recording studio here. We're here in Las Vegas. We have a nine room office here in Las Vegas. We have recording studios here, offices. We're here. And and and, and by the way, I so let you know, let the people know, I have about maybe 10,000 tracks never released that's on NPC 60. I'm coming out next week. It's been planned for the last two years, finally getting to it. It's called Daryl Payne, Rare Grooves, Volume One. We have enough for every month. We're coming out with all these rare dance grooves from back in those days, because what I realized, Lenny, when I was younger, I knew I was going to be busy with business. So I wanted to record all my music when I was younger. So when I got older, I don't have to worry about trying to recapture something from back in the day. I already have it. It's just updating the sounds, putting new singers on it, new lyrics, and away we go. So I have all that music. I never stopped making music. I never stopped making music. I have it all. But this time, the difference is when I was young, you know, we were chasing hits. The labels, here's 20,000, here's 30,000, here's 100,000. We were chasing hits. Now we want to build catalogs. We want to own the catalogs. Content is king. Content big big is time. King. Say that nice and slow for everybody. Content is king. Your pension at the end of all these crazy issues you put in this business. It's something you can sell that's of value. When you no longer want to be in this business, you want to sell it to the sunset, you have something you can sell. If you look at artists like Barry Manilow, he sold his catalog. Tina Turner, he sold his catalog. They sold their rights to their publishing. Their rights, their, there has to be something at the end that you the can rainbow. get. The rainbow end. Yes, like Judy Garland, you know, you have to, it has to be a light at the end of the rainbow. We don't do that. Uh, listen. It's un it's sad, Lenny. It's unfortunate. All my guys, they, they have they, they got nothing. They, there's nothing to sign. Then you hear, oh, this guy had a stroke. Oh, Daryl, your buddy had a heart well, attack. Well, here's a, this is the question that you when you're outside the business, people don't understand. They don't understand the parts of the publishing, the writing. They don't. Be, a lot of these like groups didn't write their songs. They had a team of people behind them. You happen to be in the pit writing and, you know, part of that publishing that, you know, you get a piece of that. So that's, you know, that's like a pension. But most people don't understand that, that, you know, how does such and such have all these great hits and they have nothing? They don't understand. I, honey, I can explain that to you. Here's what happens. And it happens to me, too. And by no means are these labels paying me all this amount of money. Not even hardly. Not even hardly. But I will say this, when you're a hot producer in the now, today, the labels will pay you because they need you. So they're gonna make sure you get what you get. When you're OG like me and you had hit records back in the day, they have no need for you. So why should they pay you what you do when you no longer work with them, when you no longer talk to them? So they're not gonna pay you. The labels that own these catalogs of all these hits, when they sell digital sales, they sell licensing deals for movies that they sell for streaming they're not taking the proceeds what they're supposed to allocate for the writers and the publishers their portion they're just keeping the money that goes for all the major labels even the publishers when you do a publishing deal you think those publishers they're the worst son of a gun you think they're really paying the artists that sign pub the writers that they sign publishing deals with you got to be kidding they don't pay you nothing and and i'm an advocate for this stuff you know, I am an advocate that, you know, you have to speak up for your rights. You have to speak up for your rights. You, you have to, you know, then, then, then they're never going to say to you, hey, man, knock, knock, who's there? And we got a check for you. They're never going to do that. They're never going to do that. So I rebelled, Lenny. 
So my thing is, well, they, they took advantage of me for many years. So you know what I'll do? I'll show them. So I'll go buy the rights to stuff myself so I can collect that money myself. That's how I looked at it. That's the only way to look at it because you'll get frustrated. And what are you going to do? Go back to the same people that screwed you in the first place to give them some more music. So it's like getting screwed again for old time's sake. What does that make sense to you? Why am I going to go back to those clowns? They already took advantage of me as a kid. I'm going to go there some more. Oh, okay, hey, hey, I got some new music for you. And you know what? They call me. Hey, Daryl, you want to do a credibility deal? Oh, based on your track record, we'll give you a deal at Universal. Oh, we'll give you a deal at... But you're just going to get screwed again. Unless you're hot. If you're hot as a producer, you're producing hot artists, yes. Then they will treat you fairly. Then you can make some money with them. Absolutely. And let's face it, when a major label gets behind it and they want to break you, nobody can do it better than them. Everybody's got the technology today. Any body can record anything. You could be sitting in the bathroom with a record on your phone and record tracks. Everybody can upload to any platform they want. Now it comes down to, number one, who knows the business? The business. This is called the business. And who has the best songs? Who has the best recordings? But the business, that's what it comes down to, knowing this business. You cannot do business if you don't know business. You just can't. You're not going to... You just can't do it. The game is won and lost in the business. Not even who's the most talented. Look at these NBA players out here. Guys sitting on the bench and signing $50, $60 million contracts. They didn't even play. Look at guys like, you know, Dr. J and Larry Bird and Matt. Those guys didn't make, as players, nowhere near the money these guys make now. Look at the baseball players. You think Hank Aaron and Reggie Jackson made all the money these guys make today? These guys signed $300 million contracts with nowhere near the talent. And they get hurt. The minute they get hurt, they didn't want to play anymore. Oh, I'm hurt. I'm not going to play. Oh, I'm hurt. I'll call my agent. I'm yeah, well, like Yogi agent. Berra and them played with broken bones. Right, right. And Phil Rizzuto right. and them sold yeah. suits in the wintertime at the suit exactly. store. Can you imagine that? Right. They played the game. They played. You know, you know, everybody, you know, you know, these stars, even these stars today, they're making millions of dollars, these, these artists. You know what they say? I'm not going to record the next album. I'm going to renegotiate my contract. These guys just paid you. You just made millions of dollars. You can buy a bag of peanuts. He signed with that major label. Now, all of a sudden, you say, I'm not going to record this album. Oh, no, no. I want to renegotiate my contract. They're all spoiled. They're spoiled. How many artists died broke? Nothing. Not a quarter. Could you they imagine were... doing that back then? <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, I got to change your heart right now. The record's yeah. out. It's blowing up. Nah, take it all down. Stop all the presses. <laughs> what they would have done to you? Oh. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it's it. crazy, bro. What you know? And, but you're saying you're talking real truth. I'm going to assume that you are part of what we call a true student of the Hard Knocks University. Oh my God. Oh my God. Let me, let me tell you, Lenny, I know you know I'm going to get going, but Lenny, I've paid a lot of dues and I'm still paying them. You know, I'm paying them on a different level now. I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I don't have to go make a record deal. I don't have to have a hit. Our children are going to eat. Our family's going to live. We'll do okay. Nobody's going to hold a benefit for Daryl Payne. We'll be okay. When I was younger, when I was younger, we had to have that money in order to make it the next month. We had to have that. And there's so many talented producers, talented. I mean, could you imagine a guy like Kashif? The guy called me a week before he died, asked me questions, hey, Daryl, you know, how do you do this with this, with titles and back catalog and selling the publishing and getting advances? These guys were, were, were having a hard time. It's not his fault. This guy had more hits than anybody in our, in our circle. But where's the money? Nobody had money. Where's the money? For all your hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, we put our souls, we put our life in this music. We give our, everything into the music for these labels to not appreciate you, to not want to pay you your part. And these guys live like fat cats, and they sell their catalogs for crazy money. And let me tell you another thing. If it was up to me, if I had my way, when a late, if you've done a certain amount of music for Motown, and let's say Holland Dozier or whoever, that 10% of, 
of music from certain eras was done by you, when that company sells, you should get a portion of that. You should get a portion of that. Right, in, in, in theory, but th what do they get? Nothing. They get their writer's royalties or whatever. Half these artists don't even own their names. The major label owns their names. That's they, another they problem. They don't even own, they don't even own their names. It's, it's, and you would never believe, let me tell you this, Lenny, let me leave you with this. I feel sad, and this is no disrespect to artists. I go to these, these classic soul shows, and I love these guys. I'm not mentioning any names. People ask for autographs at this show. Hey, let me sign an autograph. Oh my God, I'm taking pictures with so-and-so. The people in the audience have more money than the singers on stage or the stars of the show. Because the people in the audience, they work for the government, they work for the state, they were cops, they were teachers, they get pension, they get money. These artists might work one show a month, two shows a month, might not work. They don't have the money that they should have. And they deserve better. They deserve more. If, you know, and, and, and here's another thing that, that upsets me also. When we're doing our Legends of Classic Soul, everybody wants to howl, hey, Daryl Pangles in my, oh, 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 oh. they all start screaming and howling. But they never scream and holler at the labels that sold their music at the prime of their career. When they was really selling millions around, they don't say nothing to them. But to me, they can say something to me. So I just find that kind of odd. Why is that? Why do you think that? Because I know you had to sit there and genuflect right. for moments. Because say, you know why? Because they're scared of people that are not the same color as they are. That's why. Oh, so in other words, they're calling out a brother to brother. Yeah, right, right. If you come to me, you can come cry to me about, oh, girl, you give me this, girl, give me but the other guy, the other guy's color, you say nothing to them. And like I say, they got you at the prime of your career. You don't say nothing to them. Never make a demand, never sue them, nothing. Never. Absolutely never. Never. But if it's me, oh, that son of a gun, Daryl, he's always like, yeah, it's a joke. And all I'm trying to do, you know what? I do this out of the love of, of, of doing it. I didn't need to do this. I was Daryl Payne for whatever it's worth. Long before I did a Legends of Classic Soul. People know me all over the world, believe it or not. And I'm not acting like I'm all that, but I'm well known all over the world without producing conscious on anybody. But we can't we, we can't leave you without this. Yes, sir. Because six decades of knowledge is gonna is gotta be summed up into this. Mm -hmm. A new kid comes to you, new artist, and says, Uncle Daryl, you know, mm -hmm. where do I start? What do I do? Because People don't understand the game. Like you get it from both sides. You've lived the original dinosaur business, and you also live. And I call it the dinosaur business because it does no longer exist as what we remember it—the vinyl physical business. Mm -hmm. And you also understand the algorithm and Spotify business. Mm -hmm. What do you tell a new artist? What do they you sit them down. What do you tell them? What, what is Uncle Daryl? Uncle Daryl. Yeah. The first thing I tell you is, is go into the studio, be as unique as you can, try to be different than what's already out there. The world doesn't need another Drake. They don't need another, you know, NBA young boy. Be yourself, do something that's unique. Get your numbers up, get your Spotify numbers up, get TikTok numbers, get a following, get a base. Because at least if you have a base and you have, a core audience of yours that you can sell to, you can you can make a living in this business, and try to negotiate you know good deals. Learn the business, learn that this is, you know. This business ought to be called, you know, you know. Not, the record business, it should be called or the or the, you know or the music business it should be called business show. Learn the business before you do a show. Learn this business. You have to learn the business. Most people don't even know what licensing means. These artists, most people don't even know what's a licensing deal. What's a 360 deal. They don't even know what the terminology is. They don't even know. And you're at a disadvantage when you don't know these things. Learn the business. Educate yourself about the business. And know how to deal with your own contracts. You can't even trust lawyers to negotiate contracts. So you listen to a lawyer who's representing you, who's your lawyer today. Six months from now, two years from now, if you had a problem with that contract, he's not even your lawyer anymore. You have to understand what you're signing yourself. Understand what you're signing, know what you want in your agreements and make sure you have these things in your agreements to protect yourself. 
You only look at the contracts when there's a problem. In my office here, I have two rooms dedicated with just files, contracts, thousands and thousands of deals, right? And we're digitizing, we're putting on Dropbox, we're putting on hard drives, but you always wanna be able to cover yourself with paper, the contracts. You cover your butt with paper, having yourself organized. Most producers I know, they don't have none of their contracts. They couldn't, they, they, they could, you even want to sue somebody, say, where's your contract? I don't even know where it is. They don't have their masters, they don't have the contract, they got nothing. They, right. And where do you begin with that? What do you do when someone comes right, to you and right, says, right, right, yo, right. man, I need you, yo, Uncle Daryl, I need your help, bro. Well, wait, I need to see paper or, or a JPEG. Let's say, J J send me the JPEG, email me, email me the master. I don't have that. What do you do? What do you do? Right. They, they, they don't have it. A lot of people don't have it. They just don't have it. Learn the business. You can do it. You can do it. How the hell you learn? Remember, remember the book? The business music book? You remember that book? Come on. That's right. That's right. You remember that book? The big yeah. brain book, right? Yeah. That book doesn't hold. You can't wipe it behind with that book today. No, no. It's a, it's a different day. And that's why I say, you know, you change what to, you know, be today. Do things the way it's done today. Daryl, yes. on the epitaph, when I say your name, Daryl Payne, how do we want to remember you? How do we want to remember you? I will say as a, as a person that was a part of the dance music community, hope, hope you realize and feel that I gave you whatever I had, whatever was there, I gave it my best. I tried to make you dance. And I wanted people to be able to forget about their troubles for that night when you was in that, when, when you was in that club and you felt the, the energy in the music, I tried to really put energy into music that I wrote and produced. I wanted you to feel it. And I gave it all. I gave it all. I mean, I gave you everything. I mean, Lord knows. I've, 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 I've given it up. I've, I've tried. And I might not be the most talented person in the world, but I gave you my best. I if you bullshitted your way through it, you did a good job. I'll tell you that because you did a lot of bullshit to get there. <laughs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> And they're, like, they're still going through it. They're still going through it. You know? I bet you are. I bet you're having to correct a lot of stuff. Are you going to write a book about all this? Are you getting ready yes. to do it? Yes. I've been offered you know, to do a couple of movies on my life story. So we're going to be talking to producers about that and people that I've been engaging to discuss that. It's an amazing story. Uh, you know, I've been kidnapped in this business at gunpoint. I mean, there's so much more to this, which I won't even get into in this conversation. You know, I've been through it, man. It's, you know, and I've survived it, you know, and and uh, and I love the music. It's all about the music, and and it's just all about the music, man. It's, that's what it's no, about. we know that, and and that's what we love about your story because it's so real. And of course, you can't tell everything. We want you to write that book. Mm -hmm. But one one thing I wanted to, uh, just one other last, because I know you want to go, and we don't want you to go, but we want to hold you yes, as yes. long as we can. <laughs> What's the one record that you heard? That you made and where was it that changed your life and said holy smoke i made it i i think i'd have to say the two my two three favorite records i think it'd be three one would be thanks to you by cinnamon and big shout out to barbara fowler the lead singer we have a brand new barbara fowler coming out in two days listen we're gonna give it to you Barbara Fowler, big shout out, much love to you. But I would say thanks to Congrats you. Congrats on Barbara Fowler. Congrats. Yes. yes. Beat the yes. Street by Sharon Red. And I wish she was alive today. If she was alive today, she'd be making a lot of money. Because guess what? Her music oh is radio. I hear it every day. I turn on the radio. So do I. Fans email me all over the world. If she was working and performing, it'd be bigger because she'd be performing over these many years that so she hasn't been here. But big shout out to Miss Sharon Red and her sister, Annie Ford. Much love to you. I mean, she's, you know, she's an amazing talent. And I would say the other one is Never Give You Up by Sharon Red. Classic, just anthems. And I Need You Now. I Need You Now, an absolute anthem. Those records excited me. Just, you know, I Need You Now. No News Is News is another one. Beat the Street, Thanks to You, It's All Right. Those songs, On a Journey by Electric Funk. Those songs really, when I hear it, it's like, wow. I look back and it's like, wow, did I do that stuff? Wow. Oh, yeah, you did it. Wow. You know? <laughs> You know, and when you see the young kids, they call it boogie music in the UK. When you see 22 year old kids dancing to this music, but like they wasn't even born when the stuff was made. It's just, it's just, it's just a humbling experience. I would never believe that I would see this today because it's so many years ago. 
I'm just blessed to have you on the show. My pleasure. I want to thank you for having me. Much Dad, write that book, brother. Yeah, I got to, man. There's so many stories. And big shout out to my mom, Roberta Payne, the late, great James Payne, my sister, Cynthia Uka. Just thanks for putting up with me, my wife, my children. Thank you, too. For, for and your legacy. Me. Brother, your legacy and, is yes. bigger than you. The legacy is bigger than you are. You know what? A lot of people, my family doesn't believe that. They know. The crazy part is my family knows nothing about music. They couldn't even tell you any songs. I, they couldn't tell you any. My daughter looks at me like, what are you talking about? They, what are you talking about? It's <laughs> my father. That's my dad. That's my dad. That's all they see. That's all they see. They know nothing else. But you gotta, I'm going to say this also. Yo, your records were staples in the Paradise Garage. Changed the game, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, that's ridiculousness. Like craziness. Forget about commercial <laughs> status, radio, right. top 40. It's wonderful. Those records have dropped today. The crowd goes like it was like they're brand new. Yes. You know what's funny? I'll leave it with this, Lenny. I would sit in the studio. I would say, here's what I did. I used to work on the sounds. Every bass sound, every keyboard sound, I worked to get the sound right. I just would just go to a patch and say, we're going to use a sound. I said, now, what sounds can we use that will sound good 40 or 50 years from now? That's the way I did it. Is that how you really thought? That's how I thought. You were, yes. you were actually projecting yes. that you were thinking what yes. this is going to sound like in four decades. Yes. yes. And if I thought a sound would only sound good for four years, I wouldn't use that sound. But what the hell would make the difference? How would you know? Would you, your gut instinct or just that? Uh... It's your gut. Once you've done this, as long as I've done this, you have a feeling for what will what sounds will sound old, like even snare sounds. When it, sounds that have reverb in it, pow, pow. It sounds old. Well, for all the reason I hear a lot of those Jim and Jam Lewis records. Oh, yeah, they sound dated, dude. I, I cringe. I cringe because there's all reverb out. I, I, but My they were talented, talented mofos. Talented. Talented. Listen, listen, those guys are phenomenal legends. They're up here. I'm proud yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. No question. But, but I know what you mean. When you hear it, you go, oh, that sounds dated. Right. It sounds dated. Right. I hear the Johnny Jackson stuff. You know, I hear great production, but the sounds sound dated. So secondly, dated. so let's just say it like this. You would say it in, a, in more of a sense of like being intuitive enough to see into the future yes through yes. through through the through what you're hearing not even right. seeing that's incredible bro see that's yeah. unless you say that because people were asking on the chat do you use hardware still today or are you using all inside the box you right. kind of answered it now mm -hmm. and by the way we're recording on a regular basis we use a lot of times real musicians on some of this stuff. Uh, we, what? What's that? We we're even using real musicians. Real, real musicians. Big shout out to the Vern Williams and the Vintage Soul. Them boys be putting it down. Real bass player, real drums, real keyboards. Hey man, we coming. We coming with it. You know, and by the way, this recording studio we have here, we have state of the art. Every keyboard sound you can think of, every drum sound, we have it all here. And we're shooting music videos in 5K. Latest technology, you know, and by the way, go to streamworldentertainment.com. Stream yeah, make sure you get that, everybody. Make sure you'll you get that. Streamworld, streamworldentertainment.com. You'll see all the latest music we have coming out. Big shout out to Queen Aries. We did a remake of I'm Every Woman. That's coming out today, finally. And big shout out to all the people we worked with. I want to thank all the DJs from all around the world that's helped support me on this musical journey. Without you and the radio stations and the people that buy the music, I wouldn't be here still trying to make something out of the city. So I just want to say peace and love and many continued blessings and know that I love you all and stay safe and most importantly, stay alive and I love you all. Oh, Daryl, you're the best brother. And we can't thank, thank you enough. And if you got demos, I guess, he's probably listening as an A&R because that's what his job is, to develop new talent as well. That's right. If you have any good music, send it to Daryl Payne at live.com.